Welcome to this plenary session of the International Conference on Public Policy. Um, my name is Grace Skogstead and I'll be moderating um, this distinguished um, panel of, of, of participants this afternoon. The theme for this, um, this plenary is the global reach and limits of mainstream public policy process theories. I think all of us uh, who teach public policy have been struck by the, idea, by the realization that the major conceptualizations of the dynamics of the policy process, that is how policy is made, how policy changes, dynamics of continuity and change, that the major uh, conceptualizations of the policy process have uh, originated in the United States. And they've since been used by a number of scholars to explain policy change and continuity in other jurisdictions. And this panel, uh, the remit of this panel is to examine how well these theories and uh, Anglo-Saxon approaches more generally uh, travel um, that is you know, beyond uh, the context in which they originated. And the panelists who have uh, agreed to participate in this panel today uh, are going to examine how, if at all, uh, these dominant policy process theories, the advocacy coalition framework, the multiple streams um, approach, uh, the uh, punctuated equilibrium uh, framework and historical institutionalism to name some of the most prominent examples to see how they travel and if they require modification to explain policy processes and public administration in other political systems, including those in the global south. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to, to, um, to introduce the, 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 uh, the panelists today, uh, and I will introduce them in the order in which they will uh, speak. So I'll begin with Leon Ching, who is speaking today to us, to, uh, to us today from the National University of Singapore, where she is an associate professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. She is also uh, a vice provost uh, and dean of the Office of Student Affairs. Um, Ching's work lies in making sense of apparently irrational environmental behavior, uh, whether in refusal to use recycled water, underinvesting in water utilities, or decision-making in building dams and managing rivers. Uh, our second speaker is Osmani Porto de Oliveira from the Federal University of San Paulo. Uh, he is an assistant professor of international relations uh, there, and he received his PhD from the University of Sorbonne Nouvelle and uh, holds a PhD from the University of San Paulo. Uh, our third speaker is Sabine Sorger from Sciences Po Grenoble. She is a professor of political science and the director of the Sciences Po um, at Grenoble. She has been a visiting professor at several places, including at the University of Lausanne, uh, University of Montreal, the University Libre de Bruxelles, at Newfield College in Oxford and at Cologne. And fourth speaker, uh, Wolfgang Dreschler is here today, he's present. Uh, he is um, a professor of government um, at Taltex Ragnar Nurkski Department uh, at the Tallinn University of Technology. He is also an honorary professor at University College London in the Institute of Innovation and Public Purpose. And if that wasn't enough titles, he's the associate and a member of the advisory board at Harvard University's Davis Center. So welcome all of you. And I will now turn it over to uh, Leong Ching to begin uh, the session. Thanks very much, Grace. It's an honor to be here. And I wish I were not here. I wish I was in Barcelona. Um, it's eight o'clock at night in Singapore. And I ideally miss um, meeting and speaking uh, in person. I'm grateful to have this opportunity uh, to speak about these uh, theories, which are so familiar to us. Um, and yet we sometimes think uh, that they have global reach and some limits. So I wanted to talk about why I think it's interesting to apply these theories to instances in what we call the global South. Uh, first, it allows us to test these theories. And I mean, the holy grail for all theories is that they are general in some way. So if they apply, let's say the United States, they ought to apply to other countries. So, um, so that's the first, to see how they perform and to test them uh, for this general application. Uh, so I, I thought um, it also shows us uh, how these perform 
uh, in instances where there are, so I attested one in China, uh, whether the central planning and a sort of more command and control culture makes a difference to a theory such as historical institutionalism. A second case that what I would like to talk about today uh, is on Indonesia, where, as you will know, uh, institutions may be less developed than those that are in the West. And I thought, again, this pr provides with us an interesting um, test. How do these theories hold up when the specific variables that they talk about, including communities or groups, are far looser? So I test the advocacy coalition theory uh, framework uh, in Indonesia, and to think about these coalitions as being looser somewhat uh, than we may be used to. The third, I thought uh, I would make the point that it is useful to use these theories and, and test them in the global, global South rather than sort of coming up with something that we think is our own, right? Um, because it allows us as scholars to engage on a common platform and to dialogue and speak with a common lexicon. I'm gonna show you hopefully um, that these theories translate very well to the cases that I have used them for. And there are some difficulties in using them, but I hope to show you that the difficulties arise not from any cultural or geographical or local limitations, but the limitations to be found within the theory themselves. And in the application, we will push forward these theories in very much the same way as we would do in the rest of the world. Okay, the first case I did was to test historical institutionalism in the Yellow River in China um, and to see how well path dependency holds up against, against a new policy. So um, this was um, sort of carried out under the backdrop of the IWRM, which is sort of very popular among water governance scholars. And uh, one of the big things, uh, obstacles against uh, IWRM was thought to be path dependence because to integrate various uh, fragmented agencies and interests and groups um, will become very difficult. The theory at the time was uh, because China is such a command and control that it's a strong government and it will be able to sort of realize this policy implementation in a way that demolishes uh, the pre previous past. So I wanted to test this and see whether it was in fact true. Um, in order to keep my presentation short, my slides are unfortunately extremely dense, um, but please don't worry, I'm not gonna read everything out. I, I just put them here for the sake of completeness and anyone who wants them uh, will, will be, uh, I'll be happy to make these available to you. I just wanted to quickly say that the model that I used was the ideational model rather than the classical model, which requires us to think about the role of ideas in both carving out path dependence and being the change. So uh, uh, some quick backgrounding about the Yellow River. The Yellow River for a long time uh, had a problem of zero flow, which meant by the time it got to the sea, there was no flow left. And this was hundreds of thousands, hundreds of kilometers inland. So for hundreds of kilometers before it ran to the sea, the river would dry up. And this is, a is, is, is um, because uh, as, as the river runs through the different provinces, each province will take um, its fair share or more than its fair share. So that by the time it gets to the last guy, a, a little bit like what I was talking about uh, earlier about the collective action problem, um, there's almost no water left. So um, the, at the time, integrated water management was thought to be the fixer. And um, it was meant to coordinate the extraction of water such that everybody took what was their due and then the water would therefore flow to the sea and make sure that the last guy gets his due. As it turned out, um, it was really effective and um, the water did in fact flow to the sea and the phenomenon of net zero flow uh, diminished uh, greatly after the implementation of this policy. So I was interested in how were these paths 
uh, which were sort of decades in the making, how were these sets of behaviors changed? Uh, was it true that um, it's really such an exogenous shock that you know demolished all these paths? And what was the mechanism in which this happened, by which this happened? So remember, I earlier said that I did the ideational form, which required me to identify the key ideas that led to this change. So I did an empirical investigation using the Q methodology, uh, which is a quantitative investigation of the discourse factors that was that happened um, that accompanied the policy change. Uh, and real quick, I'm just going to tell you uh, about the five or six discursive um, discourse factors that I found. Basically, they sort of reduced themselves into four big packets. There was one on economics of water use, the impact of science and technology, the importance of a local approach, and what I would call normative incentives. The last, um, the last two were somewhat surprising. Uh, the first two may be less so. Let me show you. The original hypothesis was what I would call a thin narrative, meaning that IWRM was an arbiter in the division, in the contest for water. And that the way to do this and the way that knocked down all the paths was the engineering and improvements, uh, engineering and technical improvements, which allowed us to monitor the water use at each stage, at each province. And therefore, um, this success was due to a top-down approach which allowed the government to say, okay, you get A, you get B, and you get C. This was the original thinking uh, which led to the hypothesis that path dependency theories were sort of overcome by this uh, new exogenous shock. As it turned out, uh, that's not true. As it turned out, it was a thick narrative, which I found, uh, which wasn't quite as drastic and quite as overturning of paths as we had suspected, as we had earlier suspected. So as you can see, um, the contribution to the path dependence theory and historical institutionalism are outlined. The first is the realization that the old paths are not knocked out. They do not get replaced. In fact, what we observe is an overlaying of the old narrative with a new one, and a new one that's not completely different picks up some narrative of the old. So this allows us to see not only that historical institutionalism is an interesting way to think about the Yellow River, it also allows us in the empirical application of this process to advance the notion of what dependence, uh, path dependence means, how they can be overcome, and uh, where our next bit of research should be. So in the doing of this piece of research, I thought um, we confront then some interesting uh, puzzles, right? What are ideas and how do ideational changes happen? How do they create these new paths if it, they are not completely new and they're, if they're sort of an overlay of the other? And what does it mean that these ideas are held by the community? Are they specific communities? Are there different coalitions? So this led me to think maybe it'd be interesting to um, apply the notion of ideas and narratives and see how well they do uh, in the ACF. So I, I sort of took these three puzzles on ideas and this idea of community and see how well uh, they work in Jakarta. So this is a real neat case uh, about water privatization. Um, and I took a really fun bit of the ACF, uh, which I, I think very few people uh, know about. It's called the devil shift. Uh, there is indeed such a thing. Um, and it's real cool, right? Uh, it's about how people think the adversary or the, uh, the other guy in, in sort of an opposing coalition 
uh, they think that they're worse than they are, and they deliberately sort of introduce this bias into their discourse and thinking. So the case is that of Jakarta and water privatization, um, which happened in 1997. And again, uh, the details are here. Uh, both these are from uh, published works and, and um, you can sort of find them online. Uh, I thought it was real cool to see what sorts of coalitions there could be in a relatively, um, uh, so, uh, uh, not that developed uh, sort of stakeholder mobilization community. Uh, so I, I thought that it was interesting to find three sort of separate coalitions, right? Uh, a coalition of public versus private, foreign versus local interests, and th you know, three pairs, uh, efficiency versus corruption. And I, I did the Q methodology again, uh, but this time on a far smaller sample. And then you will see that again, there are about six or seven factors. But what's real interesting is the ACF allowed me to construct this devil shift. So um, you will see that the devil um, has three phases in effect. So the coalitions, there's one specific coalition which thought of the bad guy, right? The devil as the profiteer. These are all anti-privatization coalitions. Uh, given the fact that the privatization effort went really poorly um, and the water delivery was, you know, far, far below expectations. There were no pro um, privatization coalitions, but the anti-privatization coalitions is not a homogeneous blob. They divide, divided themselves into three uh, types. The first relates to profits. The second related to power. And the third related to what I sort of would term roughly um, governance or effectiveness. And I, I argued that um, the devil shift is not merely the fact that you think the other coalition um, is uh, sort of the bad guy, right? Like he is, uh, he has some malicious motive. It is the fact that he, you think he is worse than he really is. And this bias is explicitly um, identified by the ACF. So, and it turned out it, this was an empirical proof uh, that these uh, beliefs painted both the private company and the government as worse than they really were. So I pointed out some specifics, including the idea that the company was making profits, where in fact it was hundreds of millions of dollars in losses. The, the idea that the community and the public are powerless against the government and the private company is simply not true. Uh, there were many levers uh, for them to exercise their views. So in relation to our topic today, I would say again, um, testing the ACF uh, in Indonesia allowed us to make four contributions. The first of which is the empirical co uh, confirmation that there is such a thing as a devil shift. And the three uh, is to expand the ACF, uh, which hypothesizes that the devil shift is something that's only committed by elites. That the elites think that the other group is worse than it is. But I will say, um, looking at the narrative analysis, this sort of bias is committed by publics as well as political elites. And the second, this is an empirical de demonstration of the persistence of such bias. I repeated this survey four years later uh, and the same bias still holds. And the third, the fact that I found three different sorts of devils uh, showed me that it's a matter of social construction and there are different narratives to different coalitions. So finally, I wanted to say um, to Grace's point about the global reach and the global limits. Uh, I would say definitely the global reach is immense and the limits lie less in the geography and the specific case and cultural limitations than maybe in the gaps and limits of the theories themselves, which then presents us with an interesting opportunity to see how well uh, we can expand and work on this, in specifically in the global south, because they provide a robustness test to the theory. 
and allows us to work together across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ching, that was terrific. We're going to hold um, all of the questions until we've heard from all of the speakers today. So now we will move to Osmani, Osmani Porto de Oliveri. Uh, he's also online. So uh, thank you uh, very much, Grace, for inviting me uh, to this uh, panel. It's a great honor to be here with you uh, today in ICPP. This is actually uh, the fourth time I'm uh, following ICPP. I've been uh, following it since uh, 2015 in Milan, and I'm really happy uh, to be part of such a, such a great event. I want also to congratulate everyone in the organization for uh, putting together this uh, uh, huge event in such complex uh, times. And uh, it's uh, obviously a great pleasure to be here with uh, such a, a, a nice colleagues uh, virtually uh, uh, to uh, pre present a little bit of my research on this um, uh, very uh, important topic uh, that's raised by the uh, round uh, table. So uh, my presentation is going to be uh, uh, it's going to be uh, following uh, three uh, uh, movements. I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, Grace raised to us a very complex uh, question, and uh, it's not easy to put it together in fifteen minutes. So uh, my presentation is going to focus uh, follow the tr these three movements. I'm going first of all to present. Uh, the importance and the limits uh, of, uh, of the mainstream approaches, um, in particular, focusing in my area of research, with, which is the international dimension of public policies. Uh, 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 my second movement will be to uh, talk a little bit about the adjustments, and calibrations and innovations that we need to, uh, to do towards this, um, this, uh, uh, the mainstream uh, uh, public policy process theories. And I'm going to uh, present a little bit of my research, my own research and the development of the concept of policy ambassadors that I use to uh, uh, understand the international diffusion of uh, Brazilian uh, policies, in particular, uh, the case of participatory uh, budgeting. So um, I agree with uh, uh, most of the elements uh, that uh, 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 Leon uh, Ching uh, just uh, uh, discussed. And I would like also to add uh, th that the fact that um, this mainstream theories uh, had have a great explanatory power and uh, they're also they were also very important uh, insofar as they deal with the main issues of agenda setting, uh, policy formulation, decision making, and uh, uh, political change. Uh, besides that, uh, they provide an elegant rationale for explaining policy process, focusing on individuals, for example, with the concept of policy entrepreneur uh, developed by kingdom, institutions with the historical institutionalism, and groups and collective action when we are talking about um, uh, the advocacy coalition frameworks. Um, my, I, I would like to highlight, however, a few limits of these uh, theories uh, when they, they travel across uh, the globe and across cases. And uh, of course, there are lot other limits uh, and there are al also other important elements of these theories, but I'm, I would like to focus on two here, which are mainly connected to my presentation. The first is the type of explanation, which is often uh, linear, stylized, uh, focus on a metal, meso levels, and uh, often uses uh, metaphors. For an example of a metaphor is the, 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 the use of uh, uh, primeval soup uh, that, is, that was brought by John uh, Kingdom. Uh, this primeval soup where agents uh, try to try and test their, uh, their ideas uh, uh, before they are going to be uh, set on the agenda. Often this lacks uh, precision, so we need to uh, uh, work on, on our research in order to make this uh, uh, our uh, results more precise. Uh, they also often focus on the meso level, so we leave behind the micro dynamics, the depth or the social depth of uh, policy processes, and they often uh, present uh, a simplified uh, uh, version of empirical findings. And uh, uh, on, what, uh, on what concerns my, my main uh, area of research, 
I, uh, I believe that this uh, uh, approach is often focused on uh, the fact that public policies are produced mainly by uh, governmental agents uh, and inside uh, state uh, borders. And this is why I, I think that uh, this approach is often require um, to be expanded in order to um, uh, grasp, uh, understand and access what I call the policies beyond borders, the international dimension of, uh, of public policies. The mainstream uh, approaches uh, of uh, public policy process, they overlook often the transnational engagement of policy entrepreneurs and advocacy coalition and the influence of foreign agents, uh, for example, international organizations, but also other states, uh, uh, private sector, civil society, uh, and, and among others, in the domestic policies and the power relations that emerge from these interactions. I brought here to you uh, a map with the, the leading donors to conditional cash transfer programs from 2001 to 2012. And this uh, uh, map was produced by the DEVEX. I, 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 picked up from their website. And we can see here in the Global South that there are different uh, agents as uh, banks, uh, 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 international organizations, European institutions, and foreign countries directly uh, invested in supporting social policies elsewhere. Uh, you, 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 I'm not going to in, in detail but I can, I can share this, uh, this information with you, but you have here the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, and also countries as Japan, Germany, United States, Sweden, and the United Kingdom directly invested in public policy production in a certain way in uh, the global south. So uh, when we, uh, uh, it's very important for us to uh, expand uh, our uh, analysis if, it's applicable to this understanding of policies beyond borders and also to expand these approaches beyond uh, state uh, borders. So I think that uh, uh, theories, uh, they should serve to us as a compass and the mainstream theories are not uh, uh, perfect. So we need to adjust and calibrate them. And what should guide us is uh, our empirics. And then we should reformulate and adjust our uh, theoretical framework. Uh, uh, there are different ways to do this. One way is to combine mainstream approaches with local authors uh, in the global south or in the global north, uh, and also mixing literatures or approaches. And I'm going to uh, quickly go through uh, the example that uh, I brought to you, which is the example of the, the, the globalization of participatory budgeting, which, which uh, I've been conducting research on this for, for a while. Uh, and uh, uh, with this example, I grasp the microdynamics of diffusion and uh, I adjusted the concept of policy entrepreneur to what I call the po policy ambassadors. Um, so just to give you a quick overview, I'm going to try to be very brief on this example. If, if, you, want, if you have questions, we can discuss this later, but I'm going to talk about the, the, the diffusion of participatory budgeting, which was uh, a practice of radicalization of democracy uh, developed in Porto Alegre in 1989. It's a municipal tool uh, through which uh, citizens could participate uh, uh, directly and deliberate in the allocation of municipal spending, uh, to put it very shortly. Uh, it started in 89 and uh, it uh, has reached uh, uh, all countries, maybe probably all countries in the world. I'm going to show you a map uh, in the next uh, slide. But I've been conducting this uh, uh, research on this topic for a long time. Uh, I've been in nine countries trying to understand how participatory budgeting was developed in the global south and uh, uh, in, in Porto Alegre and, and uh, globalized. And I've been following the individuals, institutions and ideas behind this, uh, this movement. Uh, I've been in nine countries, as I mentioned, and I conducted 127 interviews for this study. So this is a snapshot of participatory budgeting in 2018 with uh, around uh, seven point and a half thousand cases uh, all over the world, in the global south and also in the, uh, the global uh, north. And uh, in my observations, uh, I, um, uh, I understood that one of the key elements 
to uh, the diffusion of this uh, specific policy was the constant engagement of uh, a certain group of individuals for a long period of time. Uh, let's go back to the mainstream public policy uh, process theory. So one of the uh, most important and, uh, and recognized concepts of uh, uh, the role of individuals in public policy making is the concept develop developed by John Kingdom of policy entrepreneur. Uh, Kingdom uh, insists on the fact that uh, the policy entrepreneur are, are really, is related to people willing to invest their time and resources to push problems onto the agenda. They're responsible for coupling solutions to problems. And uh, one of their defining characteristics is uh, that they are similar to businessmen. So they're willing to invest resources, time, energy, reputation, and sometimes money in the hope of a future return. So I, I understood that Kingdom had this uh, more uh, uh, rational economic and up uh, 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 vision of uh, a policy entrepreneur uh, and uh, uh, an individual, an agent who would perform a specific uh, a role in a short period of time in uh, pushing uh, any kind of policy onto the agenda. And when I uh, uh, had my, I, when I was doing my field work, I realized that this concept was not enough uh, because my agents, my empirics were telling to me that uh, uh, the agents I was observing were people constantly engaged on a specific policy promotion. They were experts, they were staff from local government, international organizations, civil society, experts, and, and so on. They would work for a long period of time, five years, 10 years, their whole life, inside and outside uh, governmental institutions uh, promoting this specific policy. Uh, and these, they would operate transnationally. So they would not be limited to promoting a policy inside national borders, but also to promote it outside uh, uh, national borders. And uh, one of the other key distinguished uh, features of the idea of policy ambassador is the fact that the policy that they are promoting is a fundamental value uh, in, in, in their life. It's often uh, their mission in life, as if uh, promoting radical democracy would uh, be uh, the, the, their, their mission in life, and they would do this through participatory budgeting. Or uh, in the case of uh, 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 fighting a conditional cash transfers, it would be uh, fighting against uh, uh, poverty, and so on and so on. And uh, so uh, what I did was to adjust and calibrate this uh, initial idea and transform it into an innovative concept of policy ambassador, uh, which is related to uh, people working transnationally. Uh, uh, so uh, here I brought to you uh, two pictures. I'm going to go very quickly on this. I'm almost finishing. Uh, we have a picture of uh, uh, the representatives of, uh, in the, in the for, for me, it's in the left side. I don't know which side is yours, but it's a picture of the signature of a protocol of agreement to transfer techniques of participatory budgeting. Uh, and uh, the person who's signi signing is a representative from uh, Porto Alegre. And this agreement is uh, uh, signed between the city of Porto Alegre and the city of Yaoundé. In, the, in Cameroon, in Africa. And this took place in Dakar in 2012. Um, and on the, other, uh, on the other side, I have a picture of uh, one elected official of the municipality of uh, New York, uh, who is talking about the experience of participatory budgeting uh, in the city. And, uh, uh, and these are just a, a couple of snapshots of the action of this uh, um, uh, policy ambassadors in their everyday uh, life uh, in the production of uh, public uh, policies in a transnational uh, level. Uh, so uh, uh, to conclude, uh, and we can obviously discuss more about this case, I, I don't want to take a lot of your time, um, uh, to conclude and go back to the essence of this uh, round table. I, think, I believe that the mainstream approaches are very important, but they require adjustments in order to travel. And uh, it is really important to listen to your empirics uh, and also to bring a social depth 
to policy analysis, that is the micro dimensions. And in my case, I could observe this influence of specific individuals, how they operate uh, in promoting a public policy from the local level to the global level. Uh, we also need uh, conceptual innovation in order to understand different contexts and the changing uh, policy realities. And finally, uh, the, the, uh, I would highlight the need to increase the production and the mainstreaming of theories and approaches and concepts, especially from the global south and other regions. Here we are uh, discussing mainly uh, uh, approaches that were developed by uh, the, the pioneer scholars uh, from the global north. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, different from other um, uh, areas of, uh, of, of research as anthropology on sociology and international relations, we don't have much uh, of mainstream approaches from scholars from the global south. So my key message to conclude is uh, don't be afraid to innovate in public policy studies. Doesn't matter if you're in the global south or nor north, uh, just do this. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, and here you can find more about the concept of a policy ambassador and the diffusion of participatory budgeting, which is my research. Sorry if I took too much time. You no, know, that, that wasn't too much time. Thanks so much. Now we will go to Sabine uh, for her presentation. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, as, my, as my colleagues just have underlined uh, earlier, I'm, I'm very happy and very uh, honored to be with you today, uh, unfortunately from far away. Uh, uh, not that far away in reality, um, just uh, the other side of the border. Uh, so my, um, my question uh, today uh, is, of course, hopefully in line with uh, Grace's question earlier, um, uh, which means I, I would like to, to know whether public policy concepts cross borders uh, easily or, uh, or, or not. And I will focus on a, uh, on, a, on, on a framework, on an approach uh, that has already been uh, mentioned, which is the multiple streams framework. Um, and I will focus particularly on uh, uh, the term windows of opportunity and policy entrepreneurs. And I will not unfortunately go to the global south uh, because my field uh, of, of, of competence um, is the European Union. But still the question that uh, is asked uh, is, is relatively similar. So what I would like to do, uh, uh, first of all, is to um, uh, tell you already before I come to my conclusions uh, uh, that I'm, I'm deeply convinced, as are my, my colleagues earlier, um, that concepts that have been developed in a particular in a particular context, in a particular uh, geographical uh, 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 area, uh, uh, must travel. Uh, they, they do not only need to travel, they must travel. Um, I am um, uh, profoundly uh, opposed to sui generis approaches uh, that explain only one particular uh, facet, one particular uh, 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 policy, or one particular um, um, uh, area, geographical area. So really, I, I think policy approaches, public policy approaches, but also other approaches, international relations and other, we're not talking about them today, need to travel. They must, they must travel because they uh, uh, as uh, uh, Osmani just has underlined, need to uh, uh, tackle empirical problems. They need to help us to understand how the world functions, how political systems function, how uh, public policies functions, uh, uh, function. And this is something uh, uh, that is absolutely crucial. So what I would like to do today is to focus on one of those uh, uh, public policy approaches that have been mentioned, and only one, and, and show how uh, I uh, and, and colleagues of mine have used this particular approach, um, which is uh, the uh, 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 multiple streams framework. The multiple streams framework is a uh, widely used approach uh, to, to analyze, analyze policy change uh, and uh, agenda setting. Uh, 
Uh, and we have all that already heard, it's just a repetition, so that we're all on the same line, um, that uh, uh, the, the framework developed by uh, uh, John Kingdon uh, in the 1980s suggests that we can explain agenda setting and policy change in analyzing, first of all, three streams. The problem stream, the policy or solution stream, and the politics stream. Uh, these three streams are important, as you will uh, hear uh, later in, in, in my own research. The problem stream um, is a stream where we have different types of problems, um, uh, but uh, 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 these problems need to be uh, defined, they need to be framed, they need to be uh, uh, put forward, because we do have, as we've just heard, lots of problems in this, in this soup and this primeval soup. Uh, um, and uh, we need here actors that frame this particular uh, issue. Uh, in this problem stream, we are confronted with ambiguity. Uh, uh, Nico Sahariadis has developed this uh, in detail, so I'm not going uh, into that today. The second stream is the policy stream, uh, where a, a solution uh, to the problem is available. Uh, this solution depends on the value accepti acceptability, on the technical feasibility, uh, and uh, uh, the resource adequacy. And we have a third stream, which is the politics stream, uh, where policymakers must have the motive and opportunity uh, to turn a solution uh, into policy. And here, what's really important is that we measure the national mood, we, need, we measure ideology, we measure the balance of interests or uh, uh, party politics. These three streams um, are uh, uh, brought together. They are coupled, this is this perfect term. Uh, they are coupled by policy entrepreneurs. Huh? They uh, uh, couple those three streams um, uh, uh, in developing policy alternatives, uh, uh, defining the problem uh, when uh, there is a window of opportunity. Windows of opportunity can be different things, uh, as we will see in a moment. Now, the multiple streams framework exports really, really well. We have uh, a 2015 article in a policy studies journal. It's a meta-analysis by Michael Jones and, and colleagues um, where they, they make a, a study uh, uh, from uh, on, on a study based on 311 peer-reviewed uh, articles in English-speaking uh, uh, journals from 2000-2013, um, where they where they find. Uh, that uh, the multiple streams framework has been applied to 65 different countries, 22 policy areas, different levels of governance. What they say is the, 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 the use of this, of this framework is, is really prolific, but lacks inconsistency in the application of the model. We have, of course, other examples, and here I'm just offering you know, randomly chosen, uh, and I must uh, I must apologize for all those whom I'm not uh, uh, quoting now. They are randomly chosen. Uh, we have uh, Nico Sahayadi's um, article uh, in uh, from 1996, Selling British Rail, where he applies the multiple streams framework to uh, the transformation of British Rail policies um, and. Um, where he applies uh, a, a, a method that becomes very, very important later on, uh, which is the process tracing method. And he does so in, in comparing three different periods in uh, British politics, uh, leading to the privatization of, of British Rail. We have much later uh, uh, Nicole, Her Nicole Herwig's study on European Union policymaking, and particularly the regulatory shift in natural gas market policy, where she applies the multiple streams work overall. Then we have two other studies uh, I'm, I'm particularly aware of, and, and I'm promoting here uh, uh, the French, the, the younger French uh, colleagues, um, Eva Derrand, uh, who studied the um, uh, nuclear policy of the European Union, 
and Chloe Beru, uh, who studied the, 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 mechanics, the mechanics of influence uh, uh, and applied the multiple streams framework to a, uh, uh, the study of e-health policies at a domestic level. So the possibilities to apply the framework to non-US context is, is very high, but we have a number of issues when applying that to the European Union. And I'll try to go quickly through uh, two examples from my own work. Uh, the first one um, is a study uh, I have conducted with my colleague uh, Fabien Terpin, uh, published in 2016 and 21, on the EU, where we compare two crisis situations uh, uh, with regard to the Economic and Monetary Union. 2004-2005 um, crisis of the Stability and Growth Pact, um, where we observe a softening of the regulatory frame as an outcome of the, of the crisis. And the 2008 uh, Stability and Growth Pact crisis, the economic and financial crisis as we know it, um, which led to a hardening of the regulatory frame. And we wondered why uh, this is so. And we applied the multiple streams framework uh, uh, in a particular way. Uh, uh, we uh, focused on two specific issues uh, that I have mentioned earlier. We focused on the windows of opportunity and the policy entrepreneurs. And we tried to uh, uh, deal with this issue by um, uh, uh, measuring the size of the window of opportunity and measuring uh, uh, the coherence of uh, the policy entrepreneur. And uh, what's important here to, uh, to remember uh, uh, is what I've said earlier, the EU uh, offers a series of difficulties when applying uh, this uh, multiple streams framework, this framework to the European Union, which is first uh, of all, um, uh, uh, the fact that uh, uh, the uh, political stream, which is measured by party politics, ideology, uh, interest groups, uh, and so on and so forth, is extremely complex to measure in the European Union. Why? The, the measurement of, poli of, of a European mood uh, uh, or the measurement of party ideology is based on today 27 different states and it's extremely difficult to to find one measurement that allows us to see to see an overall picture we tried with the eurobarometer and it was uh, totally unconclusive uh, uh, in, in in doing so the second issue is the multi-level governance system of the european union makes it difficult to jump from one, uh, from one governance level to another. Uh, um, and this makes the, 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 the whole approach uh, more complex, uh, not impossible to do so, but more complex. And then thirdly, and that's important, we have in the European Union um, intergovernmental elements. We have sovereignty elements. We have uh, uh, issues that we, we, we go back to international relations, go back to external relations, go back to state power issues. And, uh, uh, and this is, of course, something that one has to take into account. Uh, what is absolutely uh, fantastic with the multiple streams framework uh, uh, is that the multiple streams framework uh, is a, an approach that focuses on agency. And uh, 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 I think we relatively agree, all the three uh, speakers uh, uh, until now, that agency is a crucial element in explaining policy change. And this is why uh, uh, this, this particular approach is, uh, is, so, uh, is so relevant, because um, it allows to never forget uh, agency in this uh, particular issue. And now I'm going very, very quickly to my last example, so I'm jumping over that, uh, which is the, the question of uh, 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 the multiple streams framework and policy entrepreneurs. And here I've tried to do something that is highly criticized uh, by, by, by colleagues, and I, I do agree, but, but still, still, I try to um, uh, 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 get your ideas on this particular uh, aim of mine. There is a puzzlement, uh, uh, and I've worked uh, 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 a lot lately on, uh, on, on the Court of Justice of the European Union. There is a puzzlement 
uh, because courts are central actors in political systems. Uh, uh, constitutional courts have become more and more prevalent a, a, across the world. And what I what 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 I realized is that public policy approaches, but also the multiple streams framework, does not really take uh, courts into account. And my question was now to say, can we use uh, uh, one element of the multiple streams framework, which is the policy entrepreneurs, in order to analyze the courts? Um, studies of the court, uh, uh, usually on the, the Court of Justice of the European Union, focus usually uh, on the fact that the court is a political actor. Uh, we have studies on the judicial activism of the court. We have studies on the, on the court as a policy or political entrepreneur. But they do not really link uh, their, their analysis to uh, the multiple streams framework. So my question is, can they really be policy entrepreneurs? There are a number of methodological issues. And the answer I got uh, uh, quite unanimously uh, when I present this kind of research from multiple streams uh, scholars is to say, well, you know, your problem is that the multiple streams framework focuses on agenda setting and not on implementation. And while I entirely agree with that, um, I do believe that courts are not only active in the implementation phase, or in the evaluation phase, they are extremely important also in framing a policy problem so that it can be taken on um, uh, by other actors. So uh, 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 can courts be policy entrepreneurs uh, uh, or are they just policy brokers? I think what's really important is that we see uh, that courts create a legitimate reading of a problem. They create a legitimate reading of a problem and uh, they really frame a problem in a specific way. So in this context, they are really powerful policy entrepreneurs because it's very difficult and hard to go against them. Of course, you can overthrow uh, a, a decision, but it's, uh, it's, it's relatively complicated. A court can also be a coalition partner. Uh, uh, in particular, the Court of Justice of the European Union has often been a coalition partner of uh, the European Commission on, on a number of issues, and particularly most recently on a number of issues, uh, including uh, the rule of law. And there can be uh, policy entrepreneurs through individual judges. They participate in legal conferences. They try to create cases. So we have uh, 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 studies by uh, 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 scholars focusing on judges, on specific judges and their, and, and their influence in framing a problem, in making a problem to a, uh, a policy problem. So let me just end here uh, 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 without going into detail uh, because time is running short. The multiple streams framework exports really well, uh, and it exports also really well in the EU context. Uh, but of course, as we have heard, uh, 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 there is a caveat to take into account because the model needs to be adapted. Um, my question here is now uh, to all of you uh, and to myself, should we keep the models and the conceptual frameworks pure? Should we really, you know, not transform them, test those models, uh, uh, or on the contrary, should we adapt them? Okay. Uh, my answer to that would be uh, very strongly, uh, we should and must adapt them. Uh, they need to be adopted. Uh, uh, they need to be transformed because their role fundamentally in our study is to explain processes, phenomena, um, uh, they do not exist for themselves, but they are tools in order to uh, make our world uh, uh, understandable. Thank you very much. Yes, and I was told that I should take off the mask like a good politician. And it's really amazing to stand in front of an audience and give a real lecture to real people. I haven't done that for a while. Many of you are not the same. I'm having handwritten notes. There's no PowerPoint. Uh, I'm not on Zoom. That feels really good as well. And uh, I will still try to be brief because we are a little bit behind. Um, and it's good that I'm going uh, forth because my take on the question today is completely different than 
uh, the three we already had. Uh, for me, the main thing about this plenary panel today is not the contents of the mainstream public policy approaches, but it's that it's asked, that it's asked at all, that we're approaching um, policy approaches and we're calling them Anglo-American. That means we are not assuming a scientific neutrality of something that uh, exists abstractly in time and space, which it doesn't. There is no such thing as neutral science out there. But that we are saying that Grace is saying, should we talk about this being Anglo-American approaches? And my answer is yes, very much indeed, because that is not only not neutral, but absolutely crucial way more crucial than the purity of models or some explanatory power as important as it is. You know, there was um, really something that this attention to the Anglo-American roots of much of the social sciences that we are doing at around 2007, that it became obvious in the mainstream that there was such a thing. You know, by the way, if you talk about the mainstream and you talk about yourself, that already shows a certain level of awareness, right? If you say mainstream, you think beyond the mainstream. And uh, congratulations, Philippe, but IPPA certainly is the mainstream, you know? When we are topicalizing that here, it does mean moving ahead and moving ahead in a really important way. Because, you know, I was thinking, how has this been addressed in our conferences so far? And I don't remember any of these topics. There is a problem of theories coming from a certain part of the global north, uh, forming a certain part of, of, of imperialism in, in Milan. I don't remember this as a topic at all, but I do remember it from Singapore, only from the other side to say, we need to defend global universality. And what happened since then, of course, is that in the last two years, since we met last, this big push on various sides of questioning imperialist assumptions and structural assumptions. And of course, it starts in the US, moves to the UK and then to the rest of the world, first with uh, uh, Black Lives Matter and the uh, uh, George Floyd murder, and uh, then also beyond other forms of integration. And that has left in our world the avenue open to explore, if you will, a decolonization of public administration, public policy, a decolonial approach, and the realizing that not only what you research, but also how you research is part of the system. And this is what, for me, this panel was and what I wanted to spend my uh, few minutes on. For me, the world is hybrid. Yeah, The mi mainstream has one. There is a reason for the ascendancy of the global north, so that mainstream models explain at least part of the policy in the world. For me, that's obvious. Now we don't need to we don't we don't need to prove that with case studies. That's what I would expect. The question is, should we? And the question is, can we move beyond that? Are there possibilities to explore that? Is it really the right approach to say we are all the same absolutely everywhere, especially if we say this here? Or should we look whether there are other traditions we can take up? Um, that means in a hybrid way, is it not more interesting not to look at what everybody shares, but also what may be specific and what may explain things in one part of the world also as good, as beneficial, as productive, as equitable, and in others, not, yeah? So this is, uh, this is for me, this, um, this idea in this context, back going to the Singapore case, um, there was a big uh, debate at the Lee Kuan Yew School at that time when we had the conference there, whether the Lee Kuan Yew School should be the best policy school in Asia or the best Asian policy school. And you see the difference between the two. And that discourse has really shifted. And that is something that, as I said, at that IPPA was not the main point, um, but that there was always this idea, if you talk about Confucian PA or PP or Islamic PA and PP, that this is political and not scientific. But then, as the pandemic has shown, and as the last years have shown, there is really no scientific without political backup and political consensus. And this is a tricky thing to say, because one of the worst casualties, I sometimes think, 
of uh, Trumpism was that scientists reverted to a 19th century understanding of a pure independent science outside of the polity arena, whereas we had actually been beyond that and realized that it needs a scientific um, narrative to be backed up by politics, as we've also seen through the pandemic. And I do think that this is something that can be um, seen very well in, in this context as well. Now, I realize this is difficult for individuals. Yeah? This is what I'm not, what, what I'm saying here um, is for a large group of people who have been socialized into international PP. Um, a bit of a problem for the old flagship representatives, because if you have written four really great books on why everything is universal, you don't want to say that, Mel, should, should we look into Chinese tradition as well? You know, that's, not, that's not nice. And if you're a younger uh, scholar, it's very, very tough to go against the standards of the big journals gatekeeping as they are for the Anglo-American mainstream with a vengeance until this day, and which actually has made it necessary for, Osmani was talking about that, the younger scholars of the global south to not develop their own ideas, their own projects, or even do their own projects. Because remember, if you're writing an article about the global south, you have to justify why it applies everywhere. Whereas if you're talking about Anglo-America, you really don't. Yeah? So um, the late Christopher Pollitt in his uh, Brabant lecture uh, we were talking about that earlier, has said that um, we were all hoping that, for instance, from China and from Brazil, there would be all so more theoretical approaches that we could use. There have been less, but that's also understandable because it's so damn hard. As a colleague in Salzburg once said, I would like to do that, but I have kids to feed. So there is this issue. On the other hand, what I would a little bit disagree with is there is a very very rich legacy. There are texts that are thinkers limited by language, limited by traditions. But by now, I think one has to do harder and you need to look into more diverse traditions of what they have to offer also theoretically and not only as far as the case studies are concerned. Yeah. Um, methods, models, Images of how we see the policy process. Uh, they're not just technical. They frame the real world. Yeah. And if they come from a certain background, that is how that world will be phrased, framed and set up also for others. Yeah. We've seen that in economics, that if you um, influence the discourse in a certain way, if you say this is the window in which we can discuss this and this and this, then the really critical questions of power and domination cannot be asked. And that is something that one might want to consider. My favorite public administration example is um, if you really frame all the state discourse on public service provision, of the state is only about public service provision, you have already made a predecision of what the state is and what the state is about. This is, this is not without context. This is not uh, for free or anything like that. Um, so method is important. Uh, Sabine is absolutely right. This is how we are framing our world. And um, I do, uh, what I really like about IPPA is there are so many people here really want to, with an intellectual effort, also have this melioristic side, improve the world, have a better government. So I'm looking at a couple of them right now. But um, it's still this kind of, um, um, uh, um, this attempt you need to make uh, to question yourselves. If you are going to the global northern, or if you will, Western tradition, one of the key parts of that tradition is to question yourself all the time of whether what you're doing is really right. And right now, once again, I think for an association such as ours, and um, again, a colleague of mine has said the special thing about IPPA is, is all the people have always read two books more, so this is a nice one. Um, uh, that also gives you the opportunity to say, are we doing the right thing? Can we tap into other traditions? Is there a possibility that not everybody is absolutely the same and that there are large areas of the world that have the right, should get the chance to um, develop by their own standards and because of their own background? And so I thought um, to make just this point of this possibility 
of learning and listening and looking. And if there isn't enough other traditions to look harder again, that uh, the topic of this panel for me gave the incentive to talk about that. And I'll leave it at that. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. So now we've had four very interesting presentations and we can move now to uh, some opportunity for the audience to participate. Um, we can take uh, questions from those of you who are present and we are monitoring the online uh, Q&A and chat and we can get some questions from there too. But uh, there are people with uh, microphones who are on the uh, aisles, one on this side, one on that side. So if you have a question, please just raise your hand. Sure, thanks. Um, I'm Nora Hankelo from, I'm a PhD student at the University of Pretoria in South Africa, luckily with a European passport, which is how I got in. Um, I just wanted to ask, it's not a question, it, it was inspired by the Brazilian presenter, and maybe he can answer, but it's not exclusively um, for, for, for him. Um, you know, the last kind of highlight or conclusion bullet point was that, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to innovate and the global south should also contribute to these conversations. Um, but actually, I was um, just looking up some of the um, statistics. So in South Africa, the um, decolonizing science and, um, you know, down with science has been a really big discussion um, for, for quite a while. And some of the things that have come out is that really only 3% of academic publications are from the global south, particularly from Africa. I think Africa, um, and I was just looking up, um, it showed that all the research that was then 80% of Central Africa's research papers were produced with collaborators outside the region. And in most of those cases, the field work was done by local academics and, you know, then the European counterpart would actually write the analysis. Um, and that I think is fairly common, not just kind of, I think Africa maybe is extreme, but not the only um, example of that. Um, so my question, which I'm still trying to phrase, but I guess I'm trying to go into the direction of, it's all fine to say there should be an equal basis or pull in everyone's ideas, but it seems to me that the starting points and the kind of access to some of these conversations are already fundamentally different. The scales are, are very different already. And there's, you know, money and various other aspects that obviously come with that. But um, so that's something maybe I want to throw in because I know at least in South Africa, it's a really big discussion. How can academia actually be transformed? How can you hear voices equally considering that we come from such different starting points? And I guess at the IPPA, it's just the same really as a, at a national level. Thank you. Um, who would like to tackle that? Who would like to have a response to that question? Thank you. I, I start. I'm, I'm sure that my colleagues have lots to say as well. Um, this debate is, uh, is, is really, really important. Uh, and um, it is not a new debate. It is a very old debate that we had already uh, uh, in, the, in the 60s, in the 70s, uh, 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 in particular in international relations. And it reminds me of a debate that we have in the European Union um, when uh, the Central and Eastern European countries applied for uh, 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 membership in the European Union. And uh, the political science uh, uh, associations um, started a very proactive um, uh, policy um, in uh, creating uh, uh, collaborations, um, uh, uh, funding was available uh, from, from the European Commission, but only for uh, uh, projects that were uh, uh, divided equally between, um, um, between, between the old member states and the new member states. Uh, and this really has led, took a while, uh, it, it doesn't work uh, uh, immediately. Uh, it, it takes uh, over 10, uh, sometimes 15 years to create this kind of cooperation uh, uh, in order to not only 
um, transform the, uh, the policy the, the, the policy approaches um, so that uh, uh, they're not only Western European policy approaches, but but and based and and then applied to Eastern European uh, case studies, but really something something new. But this is not something that can be created very easily. And uh, uh, here we have a situation where it was really uh, 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 wished for, funded for, uh, and it was an active policy. So if we want to do that, and if, um, uh, 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 if, if associations want to do that, they really need to have a proactive policy in this, in a sense. Thank you. Uh, Sabine, anybody else on the panel who would like to respond to that question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Just, yeah. yeah, just a, a, maybe a quick reaction. Uh, I'm, the, I'm the Brazilian uh, uh, speaker. Uh, and uh, thanks. I think Laura is, is, is her name is, if I'm, I'm not mistaken. This is a very uh, interesting uh, question. And uh, I just wanted to make a, a comment about this, uh, uh, and uh, because uh, a few in, until a few years ago, we used to have like uh, international uh, publications uh, led by main uh, uh, scholars, and uh, what we used to see was that we had this uh, mainstream theory that uh, a theoretical chapter that was produced by. Uh, an international recognized scholar. And then you had uh, local authors from the global south uh, doing case studies, but only contributing to the empirics, trying to make uh, the, <clears throat> the, the support, the, the, the general argument. So this is a very complex logic to, to revert. And uh, uh, because of the mainstreaming of uh, the, 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 the US uh, approaches and so on that we have been discussing so far, and uh, um, uh, it's it's also very uh, complicated to to go against the system. I, I really like the, the the presentation of uh, Wolfgang, uh, which is uh, very beautiful in in theory, but in practice, it's really hard to uh, to to break these frontiers. And if you want to to uh, it, if if you do a very nice approach and you have a, a a uh, very good theoretical contribution, and you are uh, from you are not recognized. That you need to uh, compete with everything that ex exists already, including multiple streams, advocacy, coalition frameworks, and so on. So on. Uh, so maybe one uh, one thing that uh, uh, would be interesting interesting uh, for doing uh, is uh, like uh, south south. Uh, uh, academic or intellectual uh, cooperation to make these streams more visible, to make these approaches more solid and, uh, and, and so on. So uh, yes, uh, this could be a, a way, uh, one of the ways uh, out uh, in order to make uh, uh, approaches or publications more, more visible. Thank you. And Wolfgang, did you want to add something? Just very briefly. Um, just very briefly. Um, so, so even if it sounds a little bit heretical, if you, you think about that in all these integration and inclusion ideas, if you say there is a certain method and a certain formal quality that is needed, but the consequence of that is that nobody from a certain group is represented, who has the problem, that group or the formal requirements? In other words, um, I, one of the top three journals in my area recently, they were asked about contributions from Africa and they said, oh yeah, we have plenty, two of them, although no author is actually from Africa, two. So whose problem is that? Um, so this is why I was also mentioning in the context of this panel, as important as for a community like ours, beautiful, refined, high level, graduate student prone models are, if this is the reason to keep people out to contribute what they were saying or want to say, then that is something that might be looked on also. And that you say, okay, something that is a bit less formalized and a bit less applicable, but where somebody reports about what is actually happening in a maybe more narrative form about an underrepresented area of the world, that is also one way how you can step in that direction.
Okay, I think we can, thank you for your responses. I think we can have another question from the audience. Does anybody have one? No, my, my thinking was about what we're talking here is basically frameworks. And I was, I wonder whether there isn't a hierarchy of theories that still plays a role. And I mean, the structure versus agency discussion, I think this applies for public policy always, despite the context. But if we talk about the uh, all these, all these Anglo-Saxon theories, the theories of the policy process, I mean, they stem from a, from a given institutional context. And so they do not need to take that into account. And as soon as we export them to a different system, we need institutions because it's a different institutional system. So um, I'm, I totally agree that uh, we need to adapt them. We need to we need to reject them, um, but that doesn't mean that there are no like overall general tenets that we can still that we can still employ. That I don't know self interest matters or psychological uh, characteristics matter or institutions matter. This is so general. I think it applies always. But that's not true for, for, for what we call policy theories, because policy theories are just approaches, are just ways of thinking, are just frameworks that, that lead us to working hypothesis. But it's not for, I don't know, you, you may disagree, but it's not an overall general theory that is applicable to all policies all the time. Was that a question? <laughs> Your comment is noted. Yeah. Uh, we can take one more a question from here's uh, Les Powell in the front. Thank you. Uh, I'm Leslie Powell from Hamad bin Khalifa University in, in Doha. I, I, one comment I'm just wondering whether we're reifying the concept of Anglo Saxon and even to a certain extent Western. I mean, if we think of Anglo Saxon or Western political theory or policy theories, um, just in public administration, much of that was shaped by Weber, who's German, <laughs> who did work, and I defer to Wolfgang here, uh, who did work, of course, on, uh, on, uh, on Eastern religions and cultures. And so some of his thinking about bureaucracy was informed by his understanding of Confucianism. So when we now <laughs> apply our Western theories of public administration, they're actually inspired by Max Weber, who was himself inspired by Eastern tradition. So in a, in a sense, we're already working with hybrid theories. Yeah. And then if you think of Robert Dahl or Charles Lindblom as key contributors to our thinking about uh, policy processes, both of those gentlemen, I don't know their biographies in detail, but I suspect that they were themselves influenced by their Scandinavian roots. <laughs> and so, so we have, European influences on what we now think of as American theory. So I'm just wondering if we unpack a little bit what we think of as our, our own Western American Anglo-Saxon theories. They're already hybridized. And um, so there's probably more flexibility or openness even in the way that we think or should be thinking now than we even ourselves understand. So that's a comment. Um, one more thing. Um, I'm just wondering whether if we step back from theories and just think about main categories in which we wrestle with in terms of trying to understand policy, uh, it's the state. And there are certain basic functions which any state or anything that calls itself an authoritative um, co collectivity within some defined borders has to do. Um, and so just to give you an example, all rulers need advisors. At some points in history, the advice will be based on chicken entrails, uh, at other points on the Quran, uh, at other points uh, on behavioral psychology. Uh, but the function of advisor always takes place in any political regime. So again, I wonder if there's better ways of thinking about this balance of universal and particular than we're grasping in our theories. Thank you. Thank 
Does anybody want to respond? Grace, please, if I may. Thank you, Ting. Please go ahead. Thank you. I wanted to respond to the last speaker to say I very much agree um, that uh, the ideas are good or bad, sort of per se, rather than their pedigree. Um, and uh, they're just because um, the ideas are taken up and the ideas come from a specific region at this moment in time, it doesn't mean that those of us who do take them up are bereft of ideas from our whole lo own location. Um, it doesn't mean that we are some sort of intellectual um, desert, right? So I, I think uh, for, for me, the application and the use of the ideas is a way to engage in, with the world, right? Um, and, I, and that's why I'm very grateful for, for this topic, Grace, because uh, really, uh, the universal, you know, that these ideas are universal in a way. So for Wolfgang, uh, earlier you said you disagreed with all three of us. I'm not sure that we're in such deep disagreement um, because uh, when, when you said there is no need to do these case studies, um, and, and I, did, I did present two case studies, I didn't do them to test if the West the ideas from the West would apply in the global South. I did them uh, as any other test of the theory of a specific phenomenon. And I think uh, if, if we look at the ideas on a per se basis rather than a pedigree, um, then uh, we, we truly are uh, scientifically neutral, as you pointed out, uh, the, the point of science really. And this in a way may be uh, by way of illustration, the hardest of science um, in physics. So Richard Feynman, before he learned calculus formally, he had his own signifiers for calculus, for differentiation, for integration. And later when he learned calculus properly, he changed his own symbols to match the symbols that were already existing. It's a lexicon and a way that we talk about the same concepts. As, as Sabine earlier said, um, her anathema to sui generis, right? Um, this is theory. And, and I think in that broad sense, we, we do agree on the value uh, of theory and general ideas. Thank you, Ching. Did anybody else, uh, Sabine, would you like to? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, this is a fascinating discussion, but I would like to, to go back to uh, 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 what uh, uh, Ching just said and uh, what Leslie has said. I think, is it possible? It's a question. Is it possible to think in public policy uh, studies uh, based on uh, the fundamental uh, um, building blocks of a political system, instead of thinking global South, uh, North, uh, uh, US American versus European or uh, uh, Asian or I don't know, African or whatever, you know. Is it possible to think in terms of this is either a policy process or this is either a political system which functions with specific building blocks. And we take these building blocks into account and we look at them and we see how they are framed, how they are studied, why they are studied in this way. And then um, this whole debate about uh, one against the other, which is, I think, uh, a fascinating talk, of course, uh, uh, but to a certain extent, we import uh, uh, something uh, um, we would like to reject in these uh, 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 decolonial studies, uh, which is, in fact, competition um, uh, between specific uh, analysis and uh, uh, power games um, might be an interesting step forward in order to create something new instead of um, opposing, uh, again, one against another. Thank you, Sabine. Uh, Wolfgang. 
Yeah, so, so I think um, we do have a general consensus of hybridity, which is a fact of life today in the, in the globalized world in which we are. What um, I think, though, is that hybridity doesn't need particular advocacy today. And that, you know, once again, I would argue that the mainstream is the mainstream because it's so good and explains so much. So we know that. And every, every thought comes from somewhere in an organic way and it puts up. But uh, given the positionality of us in the year 2021, in the area in which we are in, I just think that it is a good idea to emphasize looking for specifics, for other forms of agencies, for institutional logics in regions that we might not have taken into consideration, but should. So I would look at it from, from this perspective. Partially, it's indeed true that you get um, thinkers in the global south who use certain uh, Western thinkers more than they are now used in the West, where they have basically been written off as obsolete or offensive. But on the other hand, um, that is an agency you want mind to give to these people and not to others. So um, there is a dual thing here. Um, the one is the agency, as we mentioned, the agency of the people who are doing it, the researchers and so on. And the other one is the one of ideas where, where we are looking. But, um, you know, it seems to me a little bit early to now close this discussion and say again, yeah, but there are universals in human life and we are all the same and there are these large policies. This is all true. It's all important. It's not going away. We are not going to lose that kind of modes of inquiry. The question is, should it really be all? And I think the answer of 2021 said, no, that shouldn't be all. And we might look for other forms of looking at things and other people looking into things as well, at least as well. Okay, thank you for those responses. We have some questions online and, and here's one of them from uh, Anchor Saren. One of the issues that is often neglected is the nature of data that are available in different contexts. This is not necessarily a resource issue, but also a cultural one. Researchers' access to policymakers or policy relevant data, for instance, is likely to vary depending on cultures of transparency and attitude to research in general. I wonder if discussions on theory, whether they transfer or not, can really occur without thinking about the data itself first. Do we have anybody who would like to respond to um, this very real empirical question about the ability to, to, test, uh, to test theories if you can't get access, if, or if it's hard to get access to the data? Thanks, Sabine. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I find those questions so absolutely fascinating. Um, yes, of course, it's a, an absolutely crucial question, but you have this crucial question when you compare France to Germany. Or you have this question when you compare Italy to uh, to Denmark. So this, you know, from a European perspective, I'm I'm very sorry that I'm I'm using that, but this is this is the one I'm working on. This is something we ask ourselves, uh, and I think we all ask us uh, ourselves um, this uh, uh, quite often. And I think we should exchange more often about this difficulty, because there is a real difficulty uh, uh, if. Uh, uh, some aspects are, uh, uh, some data is, is available for someone working on a specific country or a specific policy, but not at all on another. So if you work, for example, on, I don't know, uh, um, a defense policy on the one hand, uh, uh, and if uh, someone works on, on health policy there and you compare that, you might have a differentiated access to the data as well. So uh, a very good question, but it's, it's, more, it's more general, I think, for public policy approaches. Did any of the other panelists want to add anything? Osmani? Yes, maybe just the fact that I, I would add a, a footnote to what Sabine just said, uh, uh, the fact that uh, often uh, you require funding uh, to gather your, your data. So it, if you if, if if you're doing uh, quantitative research and you can get a, a, a better database uh, from your own uh, 
office, this is one question, but if you're doing more ethnographic uh, or uh, uh, participant observant um, uh, study, uh, uh, you need to go to places, you need to uh, often travel and, uh, and you need to see publics, public policies uh, in, the, in the, 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 the moment they are, they are, they are occurring. So uh, this is also related to uh, to funding, the funding you get. So it's often uh, and, and uh, it's related to the inequalities of funding available in uh, universities uh, and in countries, regions, and so on. So it, it can also reproduce this uh, again this uh, this uh, this logics. So uh, if you want to be a, a Brazilian expert uh, of uh, of Europe. Uh, you need to get funding to go to Europe and, and get your data or to Africa or to Asia. Uh, so you, you have also these barriers and, and linguistic barriers as, as well. So, yeah, this is a very interesting question, just to complement what Sabine just mentioned. Okay, thank you. There is another um, question uh, online. Um, how can we do theory adaptation responsibly? Can too much adaptation lead to theory fragmentation where we lose the ability to synthesize research and move forward our discipline? I think, Sabine, in some ways you hinted at that in, in your own presentation, but do other, does anybody want to, to respond to this question about uh, ad too much adaptation of, of concepts in, uh, in a framework uh, then leading to the ability to really you know, carry that framework and test it out in different contexts and we end up with more, more frameworks? <laughs> Thanks, Sabine. Uh, what I would answer to this um, to this question, and and it's a fundamental question um, that we 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 tackle every day. I think as as researchers um, is to say, uh, or the way I answer that is to say, um, what we really need to do. Um, and this might be an answer to some of the questions that I've seen in the chat, uh, uh, asking how do um, editors, journal editors, uh, deal with papers that are not uh, theoretically or conceptually well defined, okay? I would answer in saying one way to avoid uh, this conceptual uh, diffusion uh, uh, um, is to be clear about the basics where you start from, showing to what extent and why what you offer uh, and what you change in this framework is necessary based on what has been done in a uh, uh, in the, in the, in a classical or in, in in the basic framework before that, and in order to make that visible, this ad addition and why it's necessary to uh, to add something, um, we really uh, do not forget where 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 we all come from, and we construct something new, and this can be something new from whatever geographical area uh, you are coming from. This would be my, my answer to this question. Anybody else uh, want to respond to that? Anybody on the panel? Okay, well, as Sabine has said, there, there are several entries in the, um, in the chat group about, um, you know, um, scholars from the from the uh, the global south possibly being locked out of, of some journals um you know I, I don't know if anybody else in the uh, wants to comment any more on that or not i mean i can see that it is a real concern okay philippe philippe okay <laughs> thank you just a, a little reaction after this wonderful debate and uh, also a reaction, what Borgon say, because he, he talked a little bit about IPG and he's right. Uh, I think this round table is inside a tradition in, uh, in our association, which need to be confronted to a paradox. And this paradox is in one, in one side, we by create this internationalization, we want to create and facilitate a common background. But at the opposite, 
this common background needs to be opposite to the homogenization. And if you see the first IC, I, I, ICPP, there is a round, the first round table was the diversity of approach. The second ICPP was the diversity of discipline about public policy. So, uh, and maybe we lose a little bit during the third and the fourth, and we come back on this, how in one sense we need to contribute to the internationalization of the academic background or academic knowledge, and at the opposite, this, how this internationalization is not a homogenization with very few approach who will become to dominate the field. So we can say different approach, different framework, but also Anglo-Saxon against different things. I'm not really uh, agree with Leslie about, I think, for example, the Weberian tradition have disappeared, even if they have translated and hybrid in the American way after the Second World War. But all the constructivist, Weberian subjective tradition is not really here today because the filter of US, who have a real specific history in the public policy field after the Second World War, have dominated in this way. So I think that our main intention is to continue to have the debate because what is important is not, maybe some of our discipline have this, and I think it's important that we continue to have a debate on ourselves with a critical perspective of we need to not be homogenized because the diversity is also the way to ameliorate knowledge and to testing knowledge, which is uh, important in academic field. So this is just a little reaction. Okay, thanks, Philippe. Um, so I, I, I think this has been a, a great uh, session. It's, it's been a terrific session. And, uh, and I, I do take Sabine's uh, point very seriously that, that maybe we shouldn't have, the question might, maybe should not have been posed the way it was that uh, in terms of uh, indicating um, the territorial origin of, of some of these um, mainstream uh, policy process theories. I do agree with her. It would be much better to just try to think about, about uh, and, and consistent with, with what uh, Fritz Sager has said, that it would probably be, be much more um, profitable, much more useful really to, to start sort of not, not put labels on, on where these theories are coming from or frameworks are coming from, but rather just to think about the fundamental building blocks of, of a theory of the policy process. So I, I, I will, to bring this session to a close, I, I want to thank all of you who participated. I'm extremely grateful um, to our panelists today, to, uh, to Ching, to Sabine, to Osmani, to Wolfgang. Um, your comments were, were very thoughtful provoking, as you can see by the questions that were raised and the comments um, that were posted online. I do apologize to all of you who were in the chat group and who raised questions that did not get answered. Um, be assured that uh, that they were read and uh, and are also thought provoking. Thank you very much to all of those who who uh, participated here in person. I, I thought this was a really great session and, and thanks so much and uh, we'll bring it to a close now. <laughs>